Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to <laughs> another virtual event of the Bastiat Society of Washington, D.C. My name is Steve Dewey, and I am the chapter director of our Washington, D.C. chapter. Uh, for our event today, I'm very pleased to have the Institute for Faith and Freedom as a co-sponsor. The Institute for Faith and Freedom is the think tank of Grove City College, promoting the values of faith and freedom and the advancement of liberty. The, uh, as for the Bastiat Society, uh, we are a, a, the public outreach program of the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known as AIER. Uh, the purpose of the Bastiat Society is to educate and promote the ideals of free market economics and sound money, property rights, personal liberty, and a free and civil society. If you would like to learn more about AIER and the Bastiat Society, our website address is AIER.org. And for more information on the Institute for Faith and Freedom, its website address is faithandfreedom.com. Today, I'm very excited to have Paul Kengor as our featured speaker. Dr. Kengor is professor of political science at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania. He is also the senior director and chief academic fellow of the college's Institute for Faith and Freedom. Dr. Kengor is a leading scholar on the history of communism and the ideology of, of Marxism. And in, in his latest book, uh, The Devil and Karl Marx, which was published in August of last year, uh, Dr. Kengor examines the connection between Karl Marx's fascination with the devil and its possible influence on the Communist Manifesto published in 1848. Marxist, uh, Marx's communist ideology has led to the deaths of over 100 million people to date to the present day. He will discuss how the communist ideology has been able to capture the, the minds of so many people around the world over the years and what can be done to counter its destructive influence. A little bit about Dr. Kengor. Uh, he is a prolific writer. He's authored uh, nearly 20 books and several bestsellers, including Pope and a President, John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, and The Extraordinary Untold Story of the 20th Century, published in 2017. The Politically Incorrect Guide of, to Communism, also published in 2017. And Noops, how America's adversaries have manipulated progressives for a century, published in 2018. He has also written foreign policy articles as a visiting fellow of the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace at Stanford University. Dr. Kangor also serves as a senior editor and columnist for the American Spectator and is a regular contributor to Town Hall, the National Catholic Register, and Crisis Magazine. He's also been a frequent guest on uh, many television networks and programs, including C-SPAN, NPR, the BBC, EWTN, MSNBC, and Fox News. Uh, he's also been a guest on Life, Liberty, and Levin uh, on at least a couple of occasions. Um, Dr. Kengor, uh, his academic uh, educational background, he. Uh, received his BA degree from University of Pittsburgh, his MA degree in International Affairs from American University, and his PhD in International Affairs uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. So before we start our discussion, please note that we will reserve approximately 30 minutes at the end of this event for a Q&A session with attendees. So please, um, think of uh, uh, questions that you uh, may like to ask and uh, they can be submitted through the uh, Q&A um, button at the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> um, so now I'd like to start our discussion with Dr. Kengor by delving into who Karl Marx was as a person. Professor Kengor, you go into 
really a lot of great detail about Marx's personal life in your book. Can you tell us uh, about Marx's personal life, including his shocking racist and bigoted views, and also his belief in the abolition of rights and his criticism of, of uh, religion? Wow. Well, <laughs> good, good to be with you, Steve. And I'm so glad that everybody can join us for this edifying, sunny, and optimistic topic. I'm, I'm sure that uh, <laughs> this, is, this is some pretty, pretty dark, ugly stuff. And it, it was, wasn't fun to research. It wasn't fun to write about it. But you know, this is, it's a very dark, destructive ideology. And Marx was a very dark, destructive person. So, I mean, boy, where to start? Uh, the, probably, you're right to note abolition. I mean, the, probably the, the two most common words that Karl Marx used in his writings were abolition and criticism. And in fact, you know, after he's done abolishing private property and money and markets, he, he says in the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels, the entire communist theory may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. And he even doubles down on that. He says, you, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property. And, and they write precisely so. That is exactly what we intend. So they double down on it. They triple down on it. And in the manifesto, they even talk about abolishing the family of all things. There's a line in the manifesto that says, abolition of the family, exclamation mark, even the most radical flare up of this infamous proposal of the communists. Uh, Robert Payne, one of his biographers, I think his best biographer, Marx's best biographer said, you know, the idea that Marx and Marxism were about helping people and sharing in this kind, optimistic, utopian view. Marx was about burning down the house. I mean, one of the reasons he goes after not just private property and the family, and as they put in the manifesto, all, mor all morality, all religion, yet even religion, even the Judeo-Christian order, is, is because they, they want to they fundamentally transform the system. Marx and Engels say in the manifesto that they're about abolishing the present state of things. I mean, imagine that, right? Abolishing the present state of things. In fact, if, if I could, I'll read to you guys. This is from pages 383 to 384 of The Devil and Karl Marx. There are, I think it's just a, a handful of bullet points here. For people, let this really think, uh, sink in. In the manifesto, Marx and Engels wrote, communism represents, quote, the most radical rupture in traditional relations. The most radical rupture in traditional relations. I mean, think about that, right? The most radical rupture in traditional relations in their own, in their own words. Communism seeks to abolish the present state of things. I mean, here I am at Grove City College, Steve, your alma mater. I mean, if a student in one of my courses handed in a paper saying, Professor Ken Gore, my thesis is that I'm going to argue to abolish the present state of things, <laughs> right? <laughs> he probably, probably set them off to Zerbe or the, or the college psychiatrist, right? You know, oh, is that all, Susie, right? Is that all, Jimmy? You just simply want to abolish the present state of things. They write in the manifesto, the communists openly declare, think about this, Steve, that their ends can be attained, ready? Only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, right? The forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. They say Marx was a bad economist. Yeah, he was a bad economist, but Marx wasn't just tinkering with economics and markets. I mean, this, this is a revolution in human nature, right? Um, the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. I, I mean, I mean, most radicals would be like, yeah, you know, we need we need to we need to fundamentally transform healthcare. Uh, you know, maybe we need to do this with the energy industry. Maybe we need to do, you know, Marx wants to throw out everything, right? Forcible. He uses words like all existing, right? They write in the Communist Manifesto: Communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. Marx, in a letter to Arnold Rouge, called for the ruthless criticism of everything that exists. So if there's another word that he used more than abolition, it was the word criticism. In fact, in his, 
in his famous opiate of the masses essay, he uses the word criticism 29 times where he describes religion as the opiate of the masses. And here, Steve, this is actually kind of a profound insight by, by Marx. Marx said, the criticism of religion is the beginning of all criticism. So they realize that if you wanna fundamentally transform everything, you've gotta go after religion. You got to go after that Judeo-Christian fabric. You've got to go after um, private property. You got to go after the basics. And here, kind of getting to the the kind of devil and Karl Marx stuff. One more bulleted point here. Marx had a favorite line from Goethe's Faust, and Marx fancied himself a poet who wanted to do nothing less than write the write the Goethe's Faust of his age. And the famous line is from the Mephistopheles character, who's the devil demon character in Goethe's Faust. And the line is, everything that exists deserves to perish. And, and friends and family said, that was Marx's favorite line. He would chant that, he would shout it, he would recite it. And, and you know, imagine, like if, if, if you or I, Steve, if they asked, did you have a favorite line? I mean, you might quote something from Bastiat, something from Hayek, right? Maybe a scripture verse, maybe a verse from uh, yeah, what, Ronald Reagan had Ronald Reagan said, "Oh yeah, my favorite line. Yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, John six so, you know, from the Bible, um, Isaiah fifty three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and I kept a plaque on my desk, and when I was governor, they took with me into the Oval Office. It said, there is no limit to how much a man can achieve if he doesn't mind who gets the credit.' Right? But, you know, uh, Ken Gore, what's your favorite line? Oh, I don't, how about be not afraid? Right? Marx." Yes, Mephistopheles, everything that exists deserves to perish, right? That's Karl Marx. So this idea that Marx had these lofty ideas about helping mankind, nonsense. Karl Marx wanted to burn down the house. When, when, when people, I've, I got this question a bunch over the summer because my book came out in August. And um, in fact, somebody even asked me this at a family, at a, at a family get together. Um, the statue movement, the people in the streets who were tearing down statues, right? Uh, you know, attacking police stations, setting things ablaze, burning things down, um, you know, Antifa, some of these other groups. So they anything in common with Marx? Yeah, Marx wanted to burn down the house, right? I mean, Mar Marx wanted to tear it all down and start over anew. So this translated into his personal life. He had a terrible personal life. He, uh, here's something for, for people watching. Name for me another character, figure in all of history who had two daughters who, co who committed suicide in suicide packs with their husbands. Mm -hmm. that, that was Marx's daughters. And one of the daughters married a guy named Paul Lafargue who was partly Cuban. So right off, Marx didn't like him for that reason because since he was partly Cuban, he was partly Negro according to Marx, right? I don't even know if, if we should consider Cubans Negro or whatever, I don't even know, but apparently Marx and Engels did. And so they tried to deduce with scientific accuracy how much Negro blood Paul had. And after making fun of him, comparing him to monkeys and, and so forth, they, 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 they deduced that, that you know, from his cranial size and everything in the shape of his hair, that he descended from the Negroes and, and that Paul had probably about one eighth as, as they put it, um, you know, N-word blood, right? Not Negro, but the N-word blood. And, and, and Marx therefore referred to Paul Lafargue, his son-in-law as the gorilla or Negrillo. So that's the way, that's the way you talk. If, you know, here we are in a cancel culture where liberals are canceling everyone, especially conservatives. And if you find an insensitive racial statement in the background of any figure that a liberal doesn't like, you know, you're done, you're toast. Karl Marx is loaded with them and they let him get away with it, you know, just like they did with Margaret Sanger. Uh, Marx came from a family, Marx was eth ethnically Jew, a family of rabbis, uh, born May 5th, 1818 in Trier, Germany. Father converted to Christianity, Lutheranism. Marx was baptized in 1823, around, around the age of five. And Marx was you know, remarkably anti-Semitic. Here's an anti-Semitic Jew. And, and some of his statements about, about Jews, quote, the Israelite faith is repulsive to me. What is the worldly God of the Jew? Money, right? What does the Jew worship? Haggling. So anti-Semitic statements, racial statements, 
Um, blacks were lower on the evolutionary scale and closer to monkeys and apes than white people. Really offensive stuff that, um, that would get him canceled by any liberal. If, if Marx was a conservative, right, with a record like this, it, it, any professor with a bust of Marx in his or her office would have a line outside the office of campus radicals shouting racist, anti-Semite, hater, big, bigot, demanding that it come down. But Marx gets away with it because, because they like where he's coming from in, in terms of his ideology. So um, you asked me a question about 10 minutes ago, I guess about, I, I don't wanna go on too much. I'll let you jump in here right now if you wanna ask yeah, me so, something else. Yeah, so uh, in your book, you talked a lot about uh, some of the um, references that Marx had made about hell and about the devil. And, um, and you asked the question, and I'll ask it right here, um, based on all the research that you've done um, on Marx and his fascination with the devil, is it fair to describe Marx as a Satanist or is that kind of not Well, some have. Uh, Pastor Richard Worm Wormbrand, who wrote the book Tortured for Christ and also wrote a book called Marx and Satan, which some of the, the Marx hagiographers have made fun of, of, of him for that. Um, but in fact, poor Pastor Richard Wormbrand in Romania was tortured for Christ. And when he was being tortured by communists, they shouted things like, we are the devil, we are the devil. And, and he said, you know, all of, the, all of the, the, the most horrible scenes in Dante's Inferno cannot compare what it's like to be tortured in communist prisons by communists. So, and Wormbrand actually makes the point that he thinks that Marx was a Satanist. I, I didn't find evidence of that, Steve. And, and, and also too, I, I quote Robert Payne, who was, again, the best Marx biographer. He did a biography of Marx, 1968, published by Simon & Schuster, another one published by NYU Press. He was a British man of letters, translation, um, drama, poetry, very well read, no right winger by, by any stretch. And he actually says, I wonder if I could find it quickly. Uh, he has a chapter called The Demons in, in one of his biographies of in one of his biographies of Marx. And he says there, oh good, I found it. Uh, there were times when Marx seemed to be possessed by demons. Wow. <laughs> Imagine that statement. Uh, he says in 1968 biography of Marx. He had the devil's view of the world and the devil's malignity. Sometimes he seemed to know that he was accomplishing works of evil. Now, I, as I say in this book, I don't try to argue that. I don't know if Marx was possessed. I don't know if Marx was a Satanist. I always tell this to my students. You, you don't want to overstate things, but at the same time, you don't want to understate things. And when you see what the guy wrote, and you read the book, so you've, you've seen some of the what he wrote in his plays, the poems that he wrote. I start the book with a quote from an 1837 play. He, uh, he, he said, um, oh, how, how does it go? My soul once true to the devil is, cho is chosen for hell. I don't want to misquote it. I know it. Thus heaven I forfeited. I know it full well. My soul once true to God is chosen for hell. Now that poem, I think, I think is, is, is in part autobiographical. Um, his soul was once true to God. I wouldn't say it was chosen for hell. Um, you know, Marx made the choices that he did, but that's an 1837 poem called The Pale Maiden, where the pale maiden commits suicide, drinks poison, just like Marx's daughters. The 1841 poem called The Player, this is from Karl Marx. Look now, my blood dark sword shall stab unerringly within thy soul. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain till I go mad and my heart is utterly changed. See the sword, the prince of darkness sold it to me. For he beats the time and gives the signs ever more boldly, I play the dance of death. And what was, what was communism but a dance of death? I mean, you can't find any ideology in history responsible for more deaths than communism. But so I'm very careful. I say, I don't know if the guy was a Satanist. As, as, I, say, as I say in the preface, right after I quote Robert Payne on that, Marx was an atheist. 
And so you would think that an atheist wouldn't believe in the devil, but, but also yeah, the Satanists are really odd in many ways. Uh, but but if, if you go to some of their websites, which I don't advise you to do, all right? I mean, this stuff is ugly. You open this stuff up and, you're, and you just, you can almost feel it, right? But, but you know, they will often say they kind of hail Satan as a figure, as a model, right? Uh, like Saul Alinsky, who in, his, in, one of his, in one of his opening quotes, Re refers to Satan as the first rebel, uh, you know, this glorious rebel who rebelled against the establishment and won for himself his own kingdom. Marx's buddy, Michael B uh, Mikhail Bakunin, same kind of thing. They exalt Satan as this glorious rebel, this first rebel. So, so they don't have to believe in the supernatural in a way to kind of be a Satanist. Now, I imagine that there are Satanists who believe in Satan and commit themselves to the devil and do all that kind of really dark, ugly, nasty stuff. I, I give the example in the book of the, the Romanian prison of Petesti, where they actually did black masses, where they actually tied religious prisoners to crosses. They had priests. These were probably usually Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. They, they had priests take human excrement and consecrate it in the form of communion, right? Consecrate it and force it into the mouths of religious prisoners. They would tie these people to cross to crosses and have people go by and urinate on them and defecate on them. They referred to Christ as the great idiot crucified and referred to the to the Blessed Mother as, as the great whore. I mean, horrible, really diabolical stuff, unquestionably diabolical. Which is why I, I say that for liberals and leftists, right, who probably you know, see this book and see the title and go, oh, <laughs> just, just, just read it. Yeah. I, I, you're going to come, you read that section on Potesti, all right? I don't care how much of a prideful left winger you are, you're going to read that, you're going to come away and say, man, that is some sick stuff. Right, that is some sick stuff. And and then read Marx's play Ulanem and some of the others. You're going to come away. You're going to say, oh, well, all right, uh, you know that Ken Gore is still a troglodyte. Uh, you know I still kind of like Marx and his ideas, and I'm for democratic socialism. But uh, but I got to admit that's some pretty weird stuff, man. I uh, got to kind of reevaluate my my thoughts about Marx a little bit. But in fact, they won't even do that, Steve. They won't even crack the book. They don't even read it. See, we read all their stuff, right? We, we, we read, I mean, you know, I go through all this bilge, all right? You know, I just, my Marxism course at Grove City today at one o'clock, we went page by page through this thing, all right? We read their stuff. They don't read our stuff. Yeah, yeah. That, they don't read Bastia. They don't read Hayek. They don't read Mises. That's, that's right. why they have the views that they have. Because they, 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 all they're talking about being open-minded, they're, they're not. They're the most closed-minded people out there. They don't read both sides. If they did, they'd realize what nonsense. In fact, I don't understand how somebody just opening this and reading it can, can, even, can even buy into it. I mean, the entire communist theory may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. You know how many people you're going to have to kill yeah. to take away their private property? Come on. Is that rocket science? Yeah, you make a good point about uh, how, uh, you know, a, uh, everyone knows about Marx and his writing, but, uh, you know, on the conservative side, like, for example, there was a survey done, I think, a couple of years ago with college students on how many college students have heard of Karl Marx and the Communist Manifesto, and it was almost 100%. Sure. And uh, then they asked uh, how many of you have heard of uh, Ludwig von Mises, <laughs> practically nobody. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, David Horowitz talks about speaking to an auditorium full of students and, and, and he asked the question, um, how many of you had heard of, who was it, who was it? I think it was Hayek, I think it was Hayek. And it was a, it was a room full of maybe 200 students and like three hands went up, right? And then he said, how many of you have read a book in the last two years by Noam Chomsky? <laughs> right? You know, like, 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 half, like half, half of the arms go up. 
right. and it, and it's that's where we are. And people ask me all the time, why is it that today more millennials say that they prefer socialism over capitalism, or in the latest poll, over a quarter say they support abolition of private property? And the answer to that is three words: education, education, education. The universities did this. The universities did this, and parents send their kids to these colleges. And, and, and pay astronomical amounts of money um, for, for these ideological brainwashings. One-sided indoctrination. It's, right. it's horrible. Yeah. Um, another uh, question I um, uh, wanted to get in with you is about uh, Marx's partner, um, Friedrich Engels. So I'm curious, um, to what degree did Engels sort of uh, mirror Marx and his personal beliefs and his personal character. Yeah, and when, when Engels first met Marx, he described him as the monster of 10,000 devils, right? The monster of 10,000 devils. That's this what Engels black, called Marx. That's what Engels called Marx. This black man from Trier, Germany. He hops, he gropes, right? It's just, it's just this, this really dark description. And I quote Engels on faith. Engels was Engels had been a, a pious Christian. It, it's really touching. He, he's, he says, you know, I'm really struggling. I'm struggling to be a good boy to believe. Almost like you're reading Augustine's Confessions at some point, right? And and Engels' father, who was a wealthy industrialist, who tried his best to get Friedrich away from these these anarch these these um, um, the, these socialists, right? These these destructive socialists. Uh, 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 Marx ended up being fortunate for Engels' upbringing, because if it wasn't for Engels inheriting all this money from his father, um, Marx would have been completely de destitute for the rest of his life because Marx refused to get a job. As both Marx's wife and mother said, they wished that Karl would start earning some capital rather than just writing about capital. So, so Engels shared Marx's views. They, they met in Paris mid 1840s. They started writing the manifesto together around 1846. It was published in 1848. And what the manifesto was, Steve, was it was a it was a an official programmatic statement of the Communist Party, actually the Communist League at that time, which was made up of about 40 to 50 people, um, all guys ex except Marx's wife, Jenny. She was a member. So 40 to 50 um, liberals, right, 40 to 50 dead white European males, right? You're supposed to not like these guys, right? But, but um, liberals do like these person, these people, if they're dead white European German socialist males, right? Uh, if Engels, good, uh, Marx, good, Frankfurt School, good, all these, Marcuse, good, Wilhelm Reich, good. So, you know, they, they apply, apply this kind of, kind of selectively. But they, so they started writing it together around 1846. I quote a letter from Engels, where he says to Marx, and I had never seen this before, he said, give a little more thought, if you, if you will, Carl, to the communist confession of faith. I think we should drop the catechetical form and simply call it manifesto. There's a lot of aping of religion here, right? And uh, Ronald Reagan said, well, yeah, communism, that religion of theirs, right? Marxism, Leninism, you know, the communist manifesto, that's their Bible. And, and it was, it was their Bible. They treated it like Mikhail Gorbachev said, they treated it, they treated that book like a canonical text, right? A canonical text. And they did. I mean, you know, that, you know, this this became their Bible. This became their Old Testament, their New Testament. And you know, this would this would usher in the New Jerusalem, the, you know, the secular utopia. The uh, the problem here was it would be it would be a New Jerusalem without God, without religion, based on the strictly material. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus told Satan, man does not live by bread alone. The communists, and I would say this too of many socialists, they really do believe that man lives by bread alone. It's, it's ironic, Steve, you know, they, they say of free marketers and, and, and of wealthy people, you people are obsessed with money. No, 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 no. These guys are obsessed with money. It, all they think about <laughs> is money. For these guys, the key to, to, to the kingdom, all right, is to abolish property, money, uh, markets, right? I mean, these guys fashioned a golden calf out of the strictly material. 
right? Uh, Augustine said there's a God-shaped vacuum in all of us, meaning that only God can fill it. No, the, the Marxists thought there is a dollar-shaped vacuum in all of us. If you, can, if, if you can just satisfy, if you can just get the class issue right, if you can just get economics right, if you can just nationalize enough and redistribute enough and collectivize enough, you will have the new Jerusalem. You will have utopia. You just need the key is economics, right? Uh, it's, it, it's a failure. Communism is not just an economic failure and a philosophical failure. It's an anthropological failure. They fail to understand human nature. And above all, the idea that, um, oh, it's easy. The entire theory made me some up abolition of private property. I mean, seriously? Yeah. The, the, I, I mean, what could be more innate and basic from the cave to the courthouse, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, a natural right, a biblical right, than the right to own property? You think you can just abolish private property? You, you're going to need one Marx biographer, I quote, it says, uh, it's absurd to blame Marx for the, for the gulags and the death. Really? Really? W how do you think you're going to take away everybody's private property? You think they're just going to hand it over to you? They're going to hand over their factories and farms and their homes and their private. You think you think you can do that without got with without guns and gulags? You're going to have a you're going to have a war on your hand, right then and there. Anybody reading this book should say, <laughs> insane idea. And 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 in fact, a lot of people at the time read this and said, this is dangerous stuff. You try to do this, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have death on on your hands. The yeah. big mystery to me, Steve, is how 172, 173 years later, anybody could take this this garbage seriously. It, it, it just completely baffles me. Yeah, actually, that uh, kind of leads me into my next question. Um, I wonder if you could you could touch, get into the history of communism. So in other words, like after uh, the Communist Manifesto was published in 1848, how and why did it begin to take hold in later years? And can you kind of touch on some of the countries that started adopting communism? Um, when did that kind of start? Obviously, the Soviet Union with, with Lenin and Russia in, in uh, 1917. But uh, what about in that period, say, between 1848 and 1917, what was kind of going on in that, in that period? Well, you can even go back further. I had a, I had a professor at Pitt, uh, Don Goldstein, who wrote the book, um, At Dawn We Slept, about Pearl Harbor. And he used to call the Jacobins in the French Revolution. So that was, you know, 1790, from 1793 to 1794, the Jacobins guillotined 40,000 people in revolutionary France. And by the way, the left today, has a cutting, cutting edge, trendy magazine called The Jacobin. And they actually have little memes and t-shirts of, of a guillotine coming down, right? They think this is cute, right? They think this is cute. The ja and they wanna accuse the right of violence, right? Um, you know, I could get so many diversions. LA Antifa group hangs Trump in effigy calls for revolutionary violence against the capitalist state. These guys do this all the time. But um, the Jacobins, Don Goldstein used to tell us, he used to call the Jacobins the first communists, which um, there's something to that, given not just what they wanted to do economically and against property, but their war on religion as well. And Lenin would call his Bolsheviks glorious Jacobins, right? Glorious Jacobins. So that was 1790s. You had, you had socialists all through the United States. You wanna look up something really crazy I don't know if I put this in this book or not. I think I have this in my Politically Incorrect Guide to Communism. I have it in my book, Takedown, too. There's hardly anything on it. You Google it, you might not find much. July 4th, 1826, 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. John Adams breathing his last, America's Jubilee. Thomas Jefferson breathing his last, Jefferson 83 years old, um, Adams 90 years old. Robert Owen, the British-born socialist, stands at his ideological colony in New Harmony, Indiana, July 4th, 1826, and declares war on the three-headed hydra, the three-headed hydra of property, religion, and marriage, right? Mm. So these guys are already at it. Mm. I mean, they're already at it. Um, Pope Pius IX wrote an encyclical called Qui Pluribus in 1846, saying, watch out for these men, these communists. They seek out to destroy property, 
the family. I go on and on. They 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 will kill people. Just just it's 1846, two years before the manifesto was even published. So so the world already knew about them. The world was already afraid of them. But not until the 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 Bolsheviks, Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, through World War One, provided the opening, and especially with the Germans putting Lenin on a boxcar and allowing them to pass through Zurich in April 1917, four days after Woodrow Wilson sought a declaration of war in the United States. And they let Lenin go through and dropped him straight into, into Russia, into St. Petersburg, you know, boom, like, a, like a human atomic bomb. And they were able to take over Bolshevik Russia. And Lenin and the Bolsheviks you know, often said, well, the only reason we took Russia was because it was, we could take it. Right? They had to have a foothold somewhere. And it was from there that they established the Soviet Comintern, the Communist International. And in March of 1919, the Comintern would be the global headquarters for the World Communist Revolution. Trotsky called it the general staff of the World Revolution. And the Comintern would, would orchestrate and command a single communist party in every country in the world. No more than one was permitted. They would all answer to the Comintern. We got ours, let's see, March to September, what, what's that, six months? We got ours six months later in Chicago, September 1919, when the Communist Party was founded in the United States, 1219 Blue Island Avenue in Chicago. That and, was 1919. Uh, 1919, September 1919. And within you know, a few years after that, it still exists. It's called Communist Party USA. The website is cpusa.org. I opened it with my students in my Marxism class last week. Steve, it's filled with nothing but, nothing but stuff on women and black Americans. Hmm. That's all, that's the whole thing. And not for Black History Month, now February. This was in January that we looked. The about section, the Marxist IQ test, refers to Marx as an abolitionist. Oh yeah, Marx was an abolitionist, all right. Okay, all right, all right. Um, and nothing to do with with black people and slavery, all right. Marx was an a different kind of abolitionist, but the website is just filled with nothing but women's rights and minority rights. If some a ninth grade public school teacher who's a socialist or Marxist opened up that website with his students, little Johnny or Susie would go home to mom and dad and say. I don't understand why you guys don't like communism. We looked at the website today of Communist Party USA. They're all about helping black people and women. There's nothing there about Lenin and Stalin and, and, and even economics. They're all about helping black people and women. I've always said that the communists are the greatest liars of all time. They absolutely are. And even guys like Woodrow Wilson knew that, okay? All right. People today don't know any of it because they don't learn about any of it in their lousy universities. OK, uh, so we've uh, actually got a bunch of questions that have come in from our attendees. So I think this would uh, be a good time to, uh, to get into some of our attendee questions. Um, looks like some really, really good ones here. So I've got a question here from uh, uh, Wendy Gallagher, uh, Wendy, thank you. Um, she asks, are you able to point to a specific event that caused Marx to turn from Christianity to this fascination with the demonic? Yeah, great question. Um, I could tell you the, so- He was actually okay. Jewish. He was actually Jewish, right? Right, right, he, he was Jewish. And again, he was baptized at the age of five the the father um had converted to christianity and oh. the yeah and 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 i quote the father a lot and the father even says you know carl it's good for a man to have faith to believe in god right to believe in something other than himself um you know to believe in a higher power but but marx left the faith in ladies and gentlemen guess guess college <laughs> so he had a he took a was basically like a systematic theology course which was taught by an atheist so nothing has changed right <laughs> it's kind of they, uh, it, but if you send your kid to grove city college i could promise that if they take a theology course it will not be taught by an atheist 
Um, I had a couple of friends of mine at my church whose, whose son was going to a secular university. And I was concerned about this. And they said, oh, it's okay. His first semester, he signed up for a course on religion. I thought, oh. And, 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 I, and I asked them around Thanksgiving or, or Christmas, I said, you know, how's the religion course going? They said, oh, it's taught by an atheist. Well, of course it's taught by an atheist. What do you think it was going to be taught by? The ghost of C.S. Lewis? Uh, but they, he hooked up with a professor named Bruno Bauer, who was um, very anti-Semitic, an atheist, teaching a theology course, denied the divinity of Christ. And by 1841, he and Marx together were founding an Archives of Atheism journal, which uh, quickly fell apart because they, they couldn't find any wealthy capitalists who would subsidize it. So, but they, um, these two would bum around, make fun of religion. Marx and, Marx and Bauer, even on um, Palm Sunday, rode into a local village on donkeys, mocking the entrance of Christ into, into Jerusalem. And uh, one of the Marx biographers describes this as, you know, a, a frolicking good time, right? <laughs> oh, how nice. <laughs> Look at this. Oh, there's such cards. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, they these guys were uh, these guys were were nasty atheists. Okay, got another uh, a, a interesting question here. This is from uh, Terry Aris Ruiz. Um, thank you for your question, Terry. He says, "Communism is capitalism. It's just that all the capital is owned by the state. <laughs> yeah. How can the in, how can that inconsistency stand without being a constant state of chaos constant yeah. revolution isn't marx just an agent of chaos interesting question yeah yeah well he so he has to completely raise the foundation right r-a-z-e raise you know take down undermine uh burn down the foundation and the i mean you so all right and according to marxist thought marxist dialectical thought according to marxism leninism According to the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, the German ideology, the different Marx writings, the principles of communism, according to Lenin's most important writing, The State and Revolution, here's how it would work. So, so history would pass through a series of stages from, from, from feudalism, slavery, so feudalism, slavery, to capitalism, to socialism, to communism. Okay. So, so eventually it would pass from capitalism through those stages. And so people often ask, what's the difference between socialism and communism? Well, um, like Marion Smith, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation likes to say, uh, just as the Christian aspires to heaven, the socialist aspires to communism. I like that right. analogy because, because, it, because it is like, again, like a new Jerusalem. It's like a religious worldview to the communists, right? You, you, get, to the, you get to the earthly utopia. And you run into people today, Steve, who say, Oh, well, I, you know, I'm a socialist. I'm not a communist. Uh, I don't want communism. I want socialism. In fact, I want democratic socialism. Well, uh, if you want to define your form of socialism as a kind that would never get to communism, you know, we're reinventing everything else today, right? I suppose you could come up with your own definition of socialism if you want. But at least according to Marx's Leninist theory, that's not what it is. And, and if you go to the citadel of democratic socialism, which is the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, uh, DSA.org. That's the they have eighty thousand members now, and that's the that's the organization of AOC, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, and the others. They refer to themselves on their website as the quote largest socialist organization in the United States unquote. And you guys should read their website and see how they describe the state and production and and everything else. You'll just see again how impossible it is that, that, that they wanted. These people, these people really need to get, I mean, get a real job in the private sector, start a business, really see how economies work. But you would, yeah, you're in, the, in, in abolishing capitalism and abolishing markets and abolishing classes and ab abolishing money and doing it, workers of the world unite and in doing it on a global basis, uh, in order to do all of this, you need everybody to agree. And then who's going to do this? Well, the, the proletariat, right? The working class. 
No, you, know, you, you will need a group of managers, <laughs> of rulers, of people with authority to decide at which point you've made the transition from feudalism and slavery to capitalism. Okay, and now we're, we're, we're now at socialism, okay? And now we're gonna move here to communism. And is, is there all, all 170 countries ready for this all at once, right? They're not ready yet, they are. They're still doing trade, they're not doing trade. They've got some property rising. We're not quite ready yet. We'll decide when we're gonna do it here. All right, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna move to this spot, right? And, and how are you going to do the production? How are you going to do everything? It's just, it's, it, it is absolute sophistry beyond sophistry. It is the most inane, impossible, just think it through. It can't possibly work. I can't believe people take it seriously. Yeah. Uh, 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 there's another interesting question here from um, about here. It, Ibrahim, um, he's, uh, he wants to know about your primary sources. He said, could you mention the primary sources that mention Marxist fascination with the devil and that show Marxist, that show Marx's racism to his son-in-law? He yeah. wants to know what yeah. your sources are. Yeah, okay, so um, I cite them all in the book, but one of the best sources is actually marxist.org. Which is, which is the official kind of clearinghouse of everything on Marx. And it's, it, it's run by guys who are either Marxist or pro-Marxist, or they're at least on the left. They have everything, they have everything. They do have a couple of the plays and, and poems that I cite are, are not up there, but most of them are, including Ulanem, O-U-L-A-N-E-M. Um, which they say is an anagram for Emmanuel um, in reference to Christ. Ulanem, O-U-L-A-N-E-M. Ulanem is up there. That's posted there. The, the, best, the best primary source book on Marx on religion is by Saul, um, uh, Saul Padover, P-A-D-O-V-E-R, Saul Padover. He, he was the best. And again, he's, I think he's from the left. He's not a conservative. And he has, um, he has all the stuff on Marx and religion and uh, the anti-Semitic stuff. That's all in there, Marx letters. And, and that book, Marx on Religion, that Padover book, I think it was 1974. And you know, so that's long before, before the stuff was all online. So most of it's online. Um, Robert Payne, Payne and his book, 1968. Uh, this is, I walked through this in this book. The, the very worst of Marx's poems were first discovered by, Mar by Marx's first biographer. Uh, oh, why can't I think of his name? Oh, I'm gonna screw that up. He is um, the German socialist who was the first Marx biographer. And in fact, when you take the next question, I might take a peek real quick and see if I could find this. And he found these Marx poems and this would have been 1890s, early 1900s. And he said to Marx's surviving daughter, the one who was really collecting a lot of the stuff, he said, you do not want people to see this. This is really, this is really ugly. This is really bad. This is chilling. This is really frightening. You do not want this. Uh, Hans Mehring, that's his name. Hans, and then Mehring is M-E-H-R-I-N-G. If you Google Hans Mehring right now, it'll pop up, biographer of Marx, first biographer of Marx. First guy to collect Marx's prime, primary sources, papers, and everything else. He said, you do not want this stuff to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. And it was a guy named David Ryazanov, a Russian, with the Marx Ingalls Institute, Steve, who had the academic and intellectual integrity to say, well, this is, this is Marx. Marx wrote this. This needs to be preserved. Um, this material needs to be kept. Uh, well, people, people, yeah. Uh, well, the... Uh, a lot of the primary sources is really, isn't it really from his own papers? Yeah, and, and I mean, certainly the Communist Manifesto, he was asking about some of the racist stuff, anti-Semitic stuff. Yeah, it's in his letters. A lot, a lot, it's, it's in his letters. Um, almost all of it comes from, from letters, yeah. Right. I, I, what else was I going to say about David Ryazanov and Hans Mehring? Um, yeah, so David Ryazanov of the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, 
at least had the integrity to preserve these things, which is far more integrity than the modern day pro-Marx biographers. I, the, I read the five or six, they're all right there. I could walk over and hold them all up. Uh, the most recent five or six biographies of Marx and they're all by pro-Marx historians. Shame on them, shame on them. They ignore all of this. They ignore all of it. It's not in any of the books. They ignore it, they ignore it. So, so which is one of the reasons I can't fault a lot of the people on the left for not knowing this stuff because their own people, um, should I say lie to them? Their own people keep this, keep shield them from, from, from these horrible truths, they do. And unless you read conservatives, right? You know, someone like Paul Johnson, by the way, Paul Johnson is in his book, Intellectuals in Modern Times, which came out probably 30 years ago now, he reported on this stuff. He reported on this stuff. But you know, ah, oh, Paul Johnson's a right-wing British historian. I'm not going to read him. Okay, well, just read your pro Marx guy. All right. And by the way, you can read you can read Paul Johnson's book and then just go to the footnotes. Go to the footnotes, and 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 you'll see the original sources, and you can trace them back. Right. You've got to read both sides. Right. If you don't, you're lying to yourself. You've got to watch CNN and Fox. Okay. You have to. If you watch only one or the other, you're not getting the full story. Okay, uh, uh, just scrolling through a, a whole bunch of questions that we have here. Uh, let's see, got one here from uh, James Bond. Um, his question is, uh, did Marx start out as dark and negative or did he become darker over time? I think you kind of got into that a little bit in your book. Uh, anyway, he says, uh, Perhaps he was frustrated that the revolution of, 18, of 1848 failed, or as he aged, he may have realized that communism would not be realized in his lifetime. Yeah, yeah, he got worse, no question about it. And I mean, so much tragedy in his personal life. Um, I, a really touching thing, he had this son who he just adored. Um, and, and the son died in his arms. It's very, very moving. It's very sad. And, and by the way, this is part of the faith too. This guy who believed that there was no afterlife, right? I mean, imagine he's holding his dead, you know, son that he just loved in his arms and that's it, right? They'll never see each other ever again. At, at Marx's funeral, um, first Jenny's funeral, his wife, Jenny, um, she too, she was an atheist, she was an evolutionist, and, and, and the evolutionary biology fueled their racism, by the way, too. That's a big part of this, right? They didn't believe that man was made in the image of God, right? They believed that people evolved from apes, and they believed that blacks were lower in the evolutionary scale than whites. At, at Marx's funeral, first Jenny's funeral, then Marx's funeral, Engels at both funerals quoted Darwin, right? He didn't quote the Old Testament, didn't quote the New Testament. He quoted Darwin. And, and, and if you read Engel's eulogy, there's nothing uplifting about it. It's like, here lies the vivacious Jenny. We all remember her. And it talks about Marx's wife. And of course, now she's just a pile of dirt, rotting flesh for the worms, right? Never exist ever again. Very dark. And Marx was very depressed. The, toward the end of Marx's life, he was very depressed. Let me add one more thing. His health was so miserable. Um, he suffered from boils and carbuncles. And uh, he, had, he had these boils all over his body. He refused to bathe. Marx refused to bathe. It's like Mao. Mao was the same way. Can't say the same for Stalin. Can't say the same for Lenin, right, or Castro. But Marx and Mao... They refuse to bathe. And so Marx, it's funny reading this doctor's report, Steve, and the doctors are trying to figure out, you know, I don't understand where all these boils are coming from on Marx. No one else in the family seems to have them. It's not some contagious disease. Uh, you know, I got an idea. A guy doesn't take a bath, right? And, and so they were, Marx even said that his carbuncles were the worst when he was writing Das Kapital. They were all over his rear end. They were on his private parts and they would send him into a rage, right? These, these boils, he had to lay on his side uncomfortably because of the boils, had him on the bridge of his nose. 
had him on his lip. He said in one letter to Ingalls, well, you know, I think the devil is throwing S-H-I-T. I think the devil is throwing excrement at my face. Mm. Maybe he was right. So uh, was the death of his son, uh, do you think that was a pivotal moment for him sort of becoming a very sort of dark person or was no that was already i mean he was already there i will say this in in his defense and biographers are torn on this but he seemed to love his daughters um he seemed to he seemed to love his kids but everybody else no one got along with him no one got along with him eventually he couldn't stand anybody he had blow-ups with everybody and Ingalls, he almost lost Ingalls too. Ingalls had, um, Ingalls refused to marry. And as Marx wrote to Ingalls, blessed is he who has no family. <laughs> right? Or as he told his son-in-law, Paul Lafargue, who was interested in marrying Marx's daughters, only an idiot would get married. Why would you want to do something like that? So Ingalls refused to get married to his mistresses. And there was, um, there was one who uh, Ingalls really loved. And she really wanted Ingalls to make an honest woman out of her and marry her. And she died unexpectedly. And Ingalls was just crushed by this. And, and Marx writes a letter to Ingalls, kind of perfunctory, something like, I'm sorry about your loss. Now on to the subject of money. <laughs> I need X amount of dollars to go on. One of Marx's uh, uh, hagiographers even says, this letter is really insensitive. Right. Uh, he, he almost lost Ingalls as a lifetime friend. Ingalls writes back this this fulminating letter. Even my capitalist friends showed more sympathy than you. By golly, Carl, you know, just just can't believe the insensitivity. But for Marx, I mean, what he really cared about was, you know, money, money, money. Right. And he was getting off to the more question of Ingalls subsidizing him so he could make some money. And Marx's poor wife, he sent her out begging all the time. Mar Marx's father cut him off. And then Marx goes to his mother after, after Marx's father died. And Marx tries to get some money from her. And he, and he comes back to Jenny. He says, here's a letter. Well, <laughs> at least I got the old lady to tear up the IOUs, right? <laughs> and so then the mother cut her off. And then Jenny's parents cut her off. Jenny actually, uh, Jenny's parents actually loaned to Marx and Jenny, the family nursemaid, Lenchen, who had grown up with Jenny. They were like sisters. And so Lenchen worked for Marx and Jenny, paid by, uh, by Jenny's family. Marx refused to pay her even a dime. The champion of the proletariat refused to pay her even a dime. And then one day got her pregnant. This is the family nursemaid, Lynchin. And then the child, Freddie, they gave him the name of Friedrich Engels. So Freddie accepted the name and paternity because he said, I can't let Marx lose his marriage. And I could give a damn if anyone thinks that I'm immoral. So they named the kid after Freddie. Marx refused to acknowledge the kid's existence and of course refused to ever pay him a penny of child support. And uh, Paul Johnson says, um, Jenny was really, any kind of remaining love she had for Marx, that really crushed her. That really wiped her out. Robert Payne says that he thinks that Marx might have raped Lynchon, that, that he can't say that the relationship was consensual. I don't know that. Um, we don't know if he had sex with her a lot one time, if he raped her. But um, either way, you know, Marx with... Uh, the boils and carbuncles on his penis and on his private parts, uh, you know, got a hold of Lynchin, got her pregnant, and Lynchin had a child out of wedlock. Marx didn't acknowledge the child, didn't pay it a penny of child support, and didn't pay any money to, to Jenny either. Yeah. Or to Lynchin either. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, so we've got another question here. Uh, this is interesting. Good question here from Robert Gay. Um, so given, he says, given the religious backgrounds of not only Marx and Hegel, but also Lenin and Kim L. Sung, what events changed their minds to espouse something so destructive to social relationships? Well, Hegel is very complicated. Hegel was a Christian. For Hegel, the dialectic of history would culminate in the, in the second coming of Christ. There are, um, 
there are what are called uh, right-leaning Hegelians and left-leaning Hegelians. The right-leaning Hegelians who believed in this kind of dialectic of history too, but they were traditionalists. They defended the monarchy. They believed in God. And then there are the left-leaning Hegelians who believed in a totally different dialectic of history. They were strictly materialistic. And for them, history would culminate in this dialectic of history, this atheistic materialism. So, I mean, Hegel would roll over in his grave if, if he knew how Marx was appropriating um, Hegel. But the Lenin hated religion. Lenin said, quote, there is nothing more abominable than religion quote, all worship of a divinity is a necrophilia, he said, and he hated religion. Marx said too, communism begins where atheism begins. So for, for these kind of modern day social justice, woke religious left Christians who say, you know, I think the, uh, I think Christians could learn something from communists and from socialists. And, you know, there's a lot to be learned here in the Christian gospel from Karl Marx. Marx would have said, <laughs> That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Communism <laughs> begins where atheism begins. And Lenin would have said, you useful idiot, right? There's nothing more abominable than religion. And Nikolai Bukharin, the founding editor of Pravda said, as I told you, quote, communism and religion are incompatible. Religion must be fought at the tip of the bayonet, right? So, so you know, these, these kind of modern day religious love people, oh, I think we could find something really nice here from Marx. They, they, they have no idea what they're talking about. The communists would tell them they're out of their minds. Okay, got another uh, uh, interesting question here. This is from Steve Farrell. Um, says, hi, Paul, great discussion. My question is, could you comment on William Z. Foster's insight that when communism comes to America, the first to be liquidated would be the socialists. His rationale is that uh, his rationale for that is uh, simply that in Soviet Russia, Lenin found the socialists, or in other words, those guys who really believe in socialism as some sort of philosophy um, caused him more trouble than any other group. And Foster basically summed up, summed it up by um, about Lenin's feelings on the socialists. They just don't get it. It's all about power. Yeah. I guess the comment on that uh, also, whether or not you think Marx felt the same way, uh, whether he really believed in it or, or believed in it as a philosophy or as a, as a path to power. I think it was the latter, but I'll defer to you on that. Yeah, um, William Z. Foster, I guess say so much about him. So he's really kind of the first head of Communist Party USA. And he was also, of course, a founding board member of the ACLU. Mm. And, you know, the ACLU was started by the Reverend Harry Ward of the, the, the of United Methodist Church, Methodist Federation for Social Action, a social justice Christian. Um, he was known as the Red Dean among ministers in the United States. And the founding executive director was Roger Baldwin, who in 1929 wrote the book Liberty Under the U.S. Constitution, right? Liberty Under the Soviets. Everybody under the Soviets. So William Z. Foster, I have this long section in the book, which is um, Foster testifying to the US Congress. And this is where communists learned after this. Listen, the next time you go and testify before Congress, right, you invoke the Fifth Amendment, all right? Don't say a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, no, no more of this kind of honesty about what we believe. And he's being interviewed here by um, Hamilton Fish, the congressman. Chairman Foster, does your party advocate, the Communist Party, does your party advocate the abolition and destruction of religious beliefs? Foster, our party considers religion to be the opium of the people, as Karl Marx stated, and we carry on propaganda for the liquidation of these prejudices amongst the workers. Fish, to be a member of the Communist Party, Mr. Foster, do you have to be an atheist? Foster, in order to be there's no formal requirement to this effect. Many workers join the Communist Party who still have some religious scruples or religious ideas, but a worker who will join the Communist Party, who understands the elementary principles of the Communist Party, 
must necessarily be in the process of liquidating his religious beliefs. And if he still has any lingerings when he joins the party, by the way, you religious left people out there, listen up, right? If he still has any lingerings uh, when he joins the party, he will soon get rid of them. But irreligion, that is atheism, is, is not laid down as a formal requirement for membership in the Communist Party. So it kind of goes on and on and on with that. But um, yeah, I mean, they were all about re um, abolishing religion until, and this is, a, this is the longest section of my book. Um, only about a quarter of the book is about Karl Marx. The longest section is on the infiltration and manipulation of churches. And after Foster, Foster was replaced by Earl Browder. American communists learned, especially from the Soviet Union, that this war on religion thing was really blowing up in their faces. I mean, sure, in, the, in communist Russia, you could take the priest and the bishop and nun and throw the nun in the gulag and shave her head, and you could blow up the church, and, and you could put the bishop on trial and then take them all out and shoot them in the back of the head, and you, know, you could cart them off to Siberia. You know, that's Bolshevik Russia in the motherland. They can do these things, right? In the United States, you can't do these things. There are too many people filled with uh, religious superstition, right? These religious, these superstitious idiots. So what are we going to do in the United States? You have this fussy thing called freedom of religion. So they decide that they are going to reach out to religious people in the United States through what Earl Browder called the outstretched hand effort. And they targeted in particular, they had their greatest success with the Episcopal Church the United Methodist Church, so the mainline denominations, and what became uh, Presbyterian Church USA. And they really targeted the Roman Catholic Church too, although that really failed because of the Catholic Church's institutional leadership in Rome, which was so vehemently anti-communist. And people like Bishop Fulton Sheen and church encyclicals, Pope Pius XI and all those folks. Um, but they had, they had their greatest success with the Episcopal Church and the United Methodist Church. And we could have a longer discussion on this, but I think this um, infiltration of the churches uh, really had an effect and um, and helping to push some of the mainline denominations to the left. And, and I think really helps explain how um, American evangelicalism ends up in the movement of going more into independent non-denominational non churches, um, Presbyterian churches, right? Um, capital O and small O Orthodox Presbyterian. Right, they really went. They really went after the mainline denominations. And uh, go ahead, Steve. You might want to take another question, but I got to read to you yeah. this. Um, go ahead. Yeah, actually, I have a I have a question um, here from Andrew Gifford. Uh, Andrew, thanks for your question. And actually, I, I'm sorry. Can I say this one thing real quick? Yeah, this sure. Is, um, okay, this is a quote from Earl Browder. Listen up. He's speaking to where else, you guys? Union Theological Seminary in New York. This is February 15th, 1935, all right? And Earl Browder, the head of Communist Party USA says, you may be interested in knowing that we have preachers, preachers active in churches who are members of the Communist Party, unquote. Members of the Communist Party, not yeah. preachers who are sympathetic to some of our aims. Preachers active in churches, ordained preachers, who are actual members of the Communist Party. How does that happen? Yeah. It, it, it has to mean that some of them were either incredibly duped or, or, or were wolves in sheep's clothing and cleric, cleric's clothing. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I was just gonna touch on a question here from Andrew Gifford because it actually I think you've already answered it. Uh, it actually, uh, I think, pertains to what you've just been talking about for the last five minutes. Uh, his question is, he says, um, this is from Andrew Gifford. He says, I am a Presbyterian pastor and often have trouble with fellow liberal left colleagues. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, can you speak to the socialist approach as the liberal left being low hanging fruit? Yeah. I write a lot about that in, in, in this book. And I've also written about it in pieces for Crisis Magazine. And, and um, in fact, I had a professor at a, at a, um, a Christian college email me last week. I wrote a piece on um, uh, religious left, shills for the religious left, something like that at Crisis Magazine. You might want to check it out. 
the uh, it, it, they get so easily misled, right? They'll say, oh, well, you know, the gospels talk about sharing and, and, and about um, pulling together private property and resources. And so does communism. So what? <laughs> so what? I, 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 so communism is about a hundred things. And here you have two or three things which are common with, you know, two or three things among a hundred things in, 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 in Christianity, you're gonna say, they're a lot alike. We go, no, communism is an atheistic materialistic philosophy that rejects God. Uh, the the, the uh, 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 Pius XI in one of his encyclicals in the 1930s said, tell these socialists, including these moderate socialists, who he said, there's no such thing as a Christian socialist. It's an oxymoron, all right? Tell them that, that if they want to help the worker, if they want to help the poor, if they want, if you know, if they want to do these things, they should just do the Christian gospel. You don't have to be a communist. Do the Christian gospel. That's all. And 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 and, and I've heard this too. Well, there are religious orders. I mean, look at the Franciscans. Look at Francis. They gave everything up. Yeah, but Francis is inspired by the passage in the New Testament. Give everything up. Take nothing more than your tunic. Go knock on the front door. Give up all your possessions. But they're doing this because they're giving themselves entirely to Christ. They're doing this entirely out of religious belief. And by the way, they're doing it voluntarily through charity and, and privately. The state isn't compelling them to give up their stuff. They're doing it entirely because of a Christian religious motivation of a future afterlife. The communists are, are doing a completely different thing. Atheistic, materialistic view where the power of the state comes in and forces you to give up your wealth, bans private property. It's a completely different thing. And also too, um, very few people are gonna join the Franciscans. <laughs> About 0.000000001%, not enough zeros there. Of, of people who've existed, right? Whereas in communism, they want 100% of everyone in society to be forced to give up their stuff, right? It's a totally different ball game, right? The, 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 these things are completely different. I am amazed at the gullibility of people on the religious left who will say, well, they talk about sharing too and helping the poor. Maybe, maybe we should, you know, the communists have some good. No, it, it, it's completely, it, it's, it's a toxic, destructive worldview. You, you know, you don't understand communism. Your thinking is incredibly simplistic. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul, we're actually at our, uh, kind of at our stopping point right here, but I do wanna take one final question. This will be our final question yeah. and answer for the uh, session. Um, and uh, then we'll wrap it up. Um, and I, I think we're gonna have to make this quick, but this is a very good question from Hardy Jonk, and actually this is something I wanted to kind of actually spend more time on because it's a, kind of a question I had as well. His question is, why has the West been so pathetic at fighting Marxism? It seems it has taken over from the bottom up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, education, education, education. education. Yep, yep. Right. And I, I was a senior in college when the Berlin Wall fell and you know, then went on to graduate school and other things. And I've been giving a talk for YAF, Young America's Foundation since the 1990s, what called Why Communism is Bad, where I get these desperate emails from students saying, yeah, I can't believe what we're being taught here. Could you please come give a talk on why communism is bad? We're being taught that it's good, right? And I go in and I talk and I bring in the manifesto, the Harvard University Press book, the Black Book of Communism, all these other books. And Steve, the place is packed with students, never professors, never professors, right? Just with the students. And, and they'll come up to me and, and they'll say, you know, I gotta tell you, we never actually read the manifesto. We've been taught about it, but we've never cracked it. We've never looked, does it really say that? And like, yeah, yeah, look it up. Yeah, it says that. So they 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 haven't been educated, and so they they don't they don't know any better, and we are where we are because of this failure to educate, 
and we, you know, we've reap what we're reaping what we've sown. So I'm not but, surprised by any of this. This is exactly where you should expect America to be after all these years of, of profound ignorance and education. So the solution, the remedies uh, to this, because so many of our universities have been taken over by leftist uh, administrators and professors. Yeah, they're sunk, they're gone, they're toast. Yeah, so the, uh, the solution would be um, alternative, al sort of uh, alternative means of um, education. Like I think a good, good example is something like PragerU. Right, yeah, PragerU. I would say, I mean, there are a few colleges out there that are safe, Grove City College, right? Um, Hillsdale, Hillsdale. Uh, there's probably a list of about 20 to 30. They're usually, you know, they're, they're usually conservative Christian colleges, right? Liberty, Regent, Franciscan, Thomas Aquinas, usually, usually places like that. Um, also, I would, and to the, the Presbyterian pastor, get, um, get this video and, and, and ask your friends to watch it right? To, to sit down through it. And it'll be hard because I'm telling you, they're very close-minded. They, they, they say that they're not, but they are. And, and you really have to say, you know, just please do me this favor. I've listened to you. This is an hour long. Just listen to this guy, all right? You, you, if you're really open-minded, if you're really open-minded, just please listen to it. Uh, but, you know, I, I think this is something you haven't considered. So use something like this. This is take an hour, right? It, you know, it does not going to take 30 hours to read a book or, or take a course. Platforms like PragerU, I didn't even know PragerU. I knew I had heard of it, but I had never seen a PragerU video until they asked me to do a video after they read an, an a Wall Street Journal op-ed I, op I did probably, I think, 2017 or uh, 2018 on Marx. And it was called something like The Real Karl Marx or Who Was Karl Marx. Steve, that thing had 3 million hits mm. in like a week wow. between PragerU and the YouTube channel. It probably has double or triple that now. So those little three or four minute educational videos, those are very helpful. And, um, and groups like this, the Basiat Society, and videos like this. So what do we have to do? Um, you know, we have to do kind of remedial education to pick up for, for, the, for the, the malpractice, the miseducation that, that kids have received in our universities. So we've got to pick up the slack now, and we have to do the educating. So here I would say, uh, you know, the, the medium of the web and computers and iPhones and laptops which in some ways cause so much destruction and so many problems and the awful problem of big tech censorship. Um, read the piece I wrote for the American Spectator on cultural Marxism and, and its conspirators and see, uh, there's a part one and part two, see how that is being framed and, uh, by big tech. Um, but, but we should, we need to fight back and use these platforms in ways to respond, to counterpunch. And, you know, and to provide remedial education as a corrective to what the educational collective um, has, um, has failed to teach. It's probably right. a good way to end this, isn't it? Yeah, it is a good way to end it. Yeah, so thanks so much, Paul. Uh, appreciate your time. And uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure all our attendees uh, appreciate it. And uh, I also wanted to mention that this is the highest attendance that um, I've ever had for one of my Washington DC Bastiat Society events. We've had, um, we had about a hundred attendees. We had many more registered, so uh, that's great. And uh, anyway, thanks, thanks again. Thanks to everyone for attending and thanks again, Paul. Sure, and uh, check us out at our Institute for Faith and Freedom website. Okay. All right, take so care, long, thanks. So long for now. All right. Okay, bye-bye.